Hello folks, welcome back to the Napoleonic Wars channel where we've got another deep dive into the latest little snippet of news that we've had about Ridley Scott's hotly anticipated film Napoleon. If you've been living under a rock you might have missed the fact that Joaquin Phoenix is going to star as the Emperor of the French. There's been a lot of excitement, there has been a lot of shouting as well and a lot of controversy about the type of Napoleon that we're getting but it's almost as though the producers of the film are responding to some of that criticism. They're giving us an insight into how this is going to play out. What we've got here is a little featurette looking at why Whack in Phoenix, in the views of Ridley Scott and Vanessa Kirby, is going to make such a good Napoleon. In amongst it all, we've been given a whole host of little snippets of battle sequences and other scenes from the film. There's even some behind the scenes stuff that we're getting to see. So there's lots to unpick here. It's going to be a kind of sensory overload as we go through the trailer. What we're going to do is watch the whole thing through and then we're going to break it down. So this is the featurette of um, why Joaquin Phoenix is going to make a cracking Napoleon. It's just so incredible i'm not built like other men i cast joaquin because of his passion ah! i will keep you guessing and scared scenes with him just felt really authentic he was unbelievable at capturing the idiosyncratic psychological portrait of this unpredictable personality when you're doing a film with joaquin he comes alive he's evolving into the point of apart Better. It was really amazing to watch him touch the really dark places. I can oh, really I like see that. him tapping into that kind of psyche. My destiny is more powerful than my will. He's one of the best. I found the crown of the cover. I picked it up and placed it atop my own head. Napoleon, exclusively in movie theaters November 20th. Wow, that's a lot to unpick. Um, so let's let's rewind that and go again and start to look at um, the different scenes that we're seeing. There are a whole host of snippets, lots of battle footage in there, I think, kind of trying to build that hype and build that excitement for the kind of the way in which this film is going to visually pop. So let's rewind the tape and uh, start to break it down piece by piece. It's just so incredible. Um. So I was an idiot last time that we did one of these and I said that Jodie Comer was going to star as Josephine. Um, no, it's Vanessa Kirby. The reason I got confused was originally it was meant to be Jodie Comer, um, but for scheduling reasons, she couldn't do it. So instead they got Vanessa Kirby in. The, the casting of Vanessa Kirby has irritated a few people, nothing to do with Jodie's ability as an actress. She's fantastic, but it's that age gap. So Josephine was six years older than Napoleon in reality. So not a massive age gap, especially not during that period, because you'd have like men who were 20 years older than their wives. So not a big deal in that period. But historically, we kind of look back on that and, and make more of it than was really necessary at the time. Um, but when it comes to the film, Joachim is 48 and Vanessa is 35. So there's quite a significantly bigger age gap going the other way. So obviously Joaquin being older than Vanessa. But it's interesting to listen straight away to what Vanessa taps into. Um, because for me, I'm really interested in the portrayal of the character. And that's what kind of she's talking about. And this whole kind of featurette seems to be about is kind of, it's almost like they're quietly suggesting to people, park the age thing and focus more on the depiction because this, I mean, the clue's in the name, right? The film is called Napoleon. It's about the man himself. And for me, I'm not too fussed about the ages of the actors provided that what this film is gonna swing on, i.e. that depiction of Napoleon and that complexity of the guy comes through. So I would much rather that we didn't have a right age actor who couldn't bring the gravitas to this role. And I think that the point to really take away from this is actually Joaquin's gonna be really good in terms of that gravitas. I know a lot of people have said he's quite mumbly and there's a point there actually, he is kind of quite quiet, 
but there's a sort of quiet intensity. There's there's something going on behind that quietness. Um, so I, I'm I'm looking forward to it. I I haven't got the issues that some people have had with all of this, but let's keep watching. I built like other men. Hmm. I picked up on the arrogance before, and the arrogance is here in this. I am not built like other men. Napoleon did have, at certain stages in his life, this kind of sense of destiny about him and look, I'm so much better than everyone else. He had massive drive as well. So actually, there's sort of a point. It, it, when he kind of, when you've got this kind of thing of I'm not built like other men, but there's a little bit that that's actually true because his work ethic was just disgustingly impressive, genuinely. You know, this is a guy who would like to take multiple letters at once. He existed on incredibly little sleep. He would just work his way through the night and wear out multiple secretaries in the process. So yeah, kind of, he wasn't built like other men um, because he, he did so much. I cast Joaquin because of his passion. Ah! Mm, I had a problem with some of this in the, when, in the first like proper trailer and it's coming through again. So we're getting lots of little fighting scene snippets, which is great. It gives us more to kind of think about and sort of see how they're going about it. Is it kind of all CGI? Is there kind of, um, I guess, a decent balance? You know, what are the uniforms looking like? What's the action looking like? Um, it's all very fast paced, so you can quite easily miss things. Um, but this this is meant to be Toulon, the Siege of Toulon, um, Napoleon's first serious engagement. Um, and the whole naval battle side of things is the historian in me looks at that and goes nah come on this isn't like the storming of the normandy beaches or something you haven't got um the, the royal navy out in the bay providing sort of remote artillery support to the troops on the ground that's not what's happening um the the british did carry out a naval blockade they actually occupied the the, the port itself where the french navy was well the mediterranean fleet of the french navy was based but you've got to also allow a little bit of kind of artistic license um and we're going to talk more about how everyone seems to be acknowledging everyone who's been involved in making the film is acknowledging that the history sort of takes a bit of a back seat uh but let's let's keep watching let's see what else we've got here we'll keep you guessing and scared oh i like that i like that a lot again look back at that like the intensity um, and those are the moments that I think we're going to really appreciate this casting choice because Joaquin, think about like the Joker. It was interesting, actually, in a, an interview for Empire, um, Ridley Scott said that he watched Joaquin in Joker and that was what made him think about uh, Joaquin for Napoleon. Um, and it's that kind of intensity and that kind of ability to unsettle you that I think is going to be really good because Napoleon, let's not forget, was a dictator. And so there are some dark sides to his character. You know, dictators are not cuddly. Um, and what we're seeing in that snippet that we've just seen is he's wearing his first console jacket. So that we're probably looking at that kind of transition from him being first console towards becoming first console for life and then going on to become emperor. And those moves were approved by plebiscites. The numbers were rigged. There's like a whole thing going on there. Um, and there were massively inflated people who just like started adding zeros on the ends of returns. The entirety of the French army was just assumed to have voted in favor of what, whatever Napoleon wanted. So it was dodgy in terms of the democracy. But despite that, there was actually a majority support amongst the population for Napoleon's moves. It was just inflated to make it look even more impressive and create this impression that everyone was backing Napoleon. Um, but what that therefore means is that because we're seeing this kind of threatening, this domineering, this aggressive, ultra intense kind of don't mess with me or I will end you, Napoleon, we're having to think about sort of the warts and all depiction of the guy. You know, we're not just getting the sort of lazy, easy, let's all just shout vive l'empereur at the screen for 90 minutes. Um, we're having to think about the fact that there's a lot more to this guy than just respecting his military skill. And that's what I'm really looking forward to 
from this film, that kind of deep dive into what it's like to be inside Napoleon's head. Because sometimes we're so blown away by the military success, or we focus so much on his failings. I'm not a fan of Napoleon as an individual. I would not go out for a drink with him, but I can respect some of his skills and some of his ability. But in the process of this, we're having to sort of think about all the different variables at once. It's a much more rounded picture of the guy rather than let's put him on a pedestal and worship him, or let's emphasize the fact that he had a lot of failings. It's it's a bit of everything. And I think that's going to help us to try and understand the man behind the myths and the achievements. And to be honest, the historian in me loves the idea of looking at the fragility behind the, the history, looking at the human that is responsible for all of this. Scenes with him just felt really authentic. He was unbelievable at capturing the... It's interesting here to see this dynamic, the power dynamic as well, because in the trailer, we've got this much more kind of um, go-getting Josephine, a sort of a, a Josephine who wasn't blown away by Napoleon, which is kind of reflective of reality. Josephine was kind of forced into the marriage with Napoleon. Um, and what we saw was kind of this pushback from Josephine that she wasn't just kind of going, oh, Napoleon, and then, you know, insert lots of cliches about romance and all the rest of it here. Instead, we had kind of a very ballsy Josephine, a Josephine sort of wearing the trousers quite a lot in the relationship. We're not getting that so much in this featurette. We're sort of getting a slightly kind of brooding um, relationship between the two, but we're also getting a kind of a, uh, th there's, there's a chemistry there. Um, there's a there's a sexual tension. I'm going to be honest. I'm I'm seeing a kind of Napoleon who who desires Josephine, which is is true of reality. So it's nice to kind of see that side of the the character being played out. But it looks like a more equal power dynamic from this. But we're only seeing you know seconds and and half seconds of of footage here. So perhaps it's a little bit too early to say quite which side we're going to get in the film. I'm hoping we're going to get this kind of rounded Josephine. Vanessa Kirby is not known for just kind of playing vacuous um, individuals on screen. She She's very much sort of one of these actresses who brings a spark and a fire to the role. Um, so I don't think she'd have been particularly keen if the the entire role was just, you know, Josephine stares lovingly at Napoleon. So I, I think there's still enough for us to be optimistic about getting a, a properly rounded Josephine. I'm hoping that actually we're going to get this kind of style of featurette, but done the other way around. So we're going to get the Josephine in the, the Napoleon story. But we'll just have to wait and see on that one. Um, but it's interesting to listen to what Vanessa is saying here. Let's just listen to a little bit more idiosyncratic psychological portrait of this unpredictable personality. See, we're, it sounds like Vanessa gets it. But she, I mean, she would, right? Because getting inside people's heads and bringing their characters alive is literally her job. And she's a cracking actress. But it's, look, you can see it on on, on the, the screen right now, that, that passion, that intensity. And there's also some unpredictability. We're going to see some of this in a second there's this sense that they're, they're separating the two apart. They're kind of going, look, this is a film. And because it's a film, there are going to be bits of it that aren't historically accurate. And, and Joaquin gets this, you know, he um, said in a, he was quoted in a, an interview with Empire recently saying that if you want to understand the history behind the period, go pick up a book because you're not going to get that from this film. That's not the point of the film, but um that, that's not the reason that we, we are watching this, right? We're not watching this to get 100% historical accuracy in terms of a run through the guy's life. Sources are also telling me that there are chunks that are being left out of the story, some of which are going to surprise us. We've also seen some total fabrications in there. Um, so there's a uh, an image of Wellington and Napoleon meeting, which is making people lose their minds. Let's see if we can just bring that up now. Here it is. Um, so this never happened, right? There was never a point at which Wellington, who's the commander of the British army at the Battle of Waterloo, and Napoleon, Emperor of France, ever actually meet. The closest they get is about 
half a kilometer from one another on the battlefield of Waterloo. Um, so they never they never have a conversation. But what we've got here is Napoleon. They're actually filming this on HMS Victory. Uh, so if we go to the next image, so this is a photo that I took of where they filmed this. Um, on board HMS Victory, this is actually Nelson's cabin. So there's an interesting kind of triangle going on there of Wellington, Nelson and Napoleon. Um, would the ghost of Nelson have liked the fact that they filmed a scene with Napoleon in his cabin on HMS Victory? I'm not sure, but that's that's a whole other thing. So um, this is where they, they filmed it. It's on HMS Victory in the Admiral's cabin, but it never happened. So they're depicting Napoleon on board HMS Bellerophon after his final defeat at Waterloo as he's about to go into exile on St. Helena. But this pipe that you can see in the background made people absolutely lose their minds, probably more than Napoleon meeting Wellington, um, because you know they didn't like edit it out with CGI or, or AI or whatever it is that you'd need to use to get rid of it. Um, but Victory's a working ship, so you kind of need to have pipes in there. I mean, that, that's what it looks like, people. What, what are you going to do about it? Um, the bigger issue is is this meeting, because that could be a problem in terms of how many liberties are they taking with the storytelling. It might also mean, and somebody made this point to me in the comments from the last one, that the entire film is kind of done in hindsight. So are we going to kind of start at the end and then work our way back? I don't know. Until we've seen the film, we, we can only guess. But this, this is a problem when it comes to the history. But... Just take a look at the still, the the power dynamic here. You know, Napoleon sat down, he's having dinner, he's in control, he's not deferential to Wellington, despite Wellington having beaten him. Um, so in the way in which we're seeing this Napoleon come through, I've got really high hopes. Um, Doing a film with Joaquin, he comes alive. I like this. This, that particular little snippet that we're seeing here, kind of Napoleon inspiring his men, very true of reality. Um, so there's there's a lot here to really be encouraged. We're going to see more of uh, Auslitz uh, right now, in fact. He's evolving into Napoleon Bonaparte. Cut off their retreat! See, in the last one, we, we had some very obvious scenes of Auslitz where we got this, what's on screen now, you know, that firing of the cannons onto the um, supposed lakes that the Austrians and Russians were retreating across, and then everybody falls through to their death. Now, I explained last time, that didn't happen. They drained the lakes. Napoleon ordered for the lakes to be drained after the battle, and they found something like 120 horses and four human bodies in those lakes. So... Napoleon goes on to kind of make out that um, thousands of, of Austrians and Russians died trying to escape across the frozen ice and then the artillery fire on them at, on his orders and that smashes the ice and they all drown to their death. Absolute rubbish. That's Napoleonic propaganda. So we're still getting some Napoleonic propaganda in here. But where you've got Joachim shouting cut off their retreat, actually, that's the whole point of the strategy at Auslitz. So Napoleon deliberately kind of throws this dummy. He weakens his right flank encourages the Austrians to go attack that weakened right flank. Davout then comes in, one of his marshals, with reinforcements just at the right moment, and then Napoleon sends uh, an entire corps, 4th Corps under Sewell, to go and smash the uh, Austrian and Russian centre, and then kind of encircle those Austrians and Russians who have uh, gone and attacked his right flank. So it's a, an incredible kind of case of throwing a dummy. And cutting off the, re the retreat of these troops is exactly the idea. So... There are going to be there's going to be enough history in there that as long as you're not going in there expecting it all to be 100 percent accurate i think you can be satisfied the enjoyment aspect is going to be key in all of this it was really amazing to watch him touch the really dark places i, I love that really i absolutely love that it, it's the unpredictability the anger napoleon could have monstrous tantrums you know throw his hat on the floor during a negotiation um, throwing cutlery across the room, uh, so smashing the crockery, you know, Napoleon in an absolute mood, that's that's good because that's, that is true to reality. That is accuracy. And so 
I know I keep saying the same thing, people, but I think we want to focus on the character more than the other things that are going on um, in the timeline that they're creating for this. It's Hollywood. They're going to make things up because that's what Hollywood does. But if you want to just kind of enjoy 90 minutes of soaking up the period, soaking up some of the feel, this is going to be brilliant. That kind of psyche. My destiny is more powerful than my will. He's one of the best. That So we got a little flash there um, of, of two things. One is the, the cavalry charge, which again, people got really peeved about because that's not historical accuracy there. As far as I can remember, there is no point at which Napoleon leads a cavalry charge. He's an artillery officer. Um, doesn't mean that he can't lead cavalry. Of course he knows the, the fundamentals of war, but it means he's never in that kind of position. But you also saw a flash of what I think might be a Waterloo scene. And you've got Napoleon kind of slashing away, trying to fight his way probably out. Um, and that's not that's not the story of Waterloo at all. Um, so that element is kind of total rubbish. But have a look at this this last bit of the, the feature. I found the crown of the cover. I picked it up and placed it atop my own head hear the gasp there it's those little things that i'm looking for more than anything else um the the gasp as he snatches the crown out of the pope's hands and everyone's kind of going whoa what are you doing because it's about the mood of those moments because this this is true of of history right um napoleon does decide to crown himself despite the fact that the Pope has come to do it. And he goes, no, I'm going to do it. I'm going to crown myself. Very Napoleon. You know, the guy was a narcissist. There's lots of evidence to support that idea. It's basically a massive power move. I kind of screw you to the Pope. I am bigger and better and more important than you. And you're kind of being forced to think about all of this. What is it? Do you actually like this guy at the end of it? Because sure, he does impressive things, but do you like what Napoleon really was in order to achieve all of these things? The quote, he never actually said that at the time of the coronation. It's actually from his time when he's on exile in St. Helena. And he remarks to a guy called Charles Tristan, who's the Marquis du Montholon, um, that he's dethroned no one. He found the crown in the gutter and he picked it up and put it on his head. So it's kind of from after the, the point. There's another version of this, which is that um, he, he found the crown in the gutter and used his sword to pick it up. So there are a couple of variations on that. It's not from the time, but again, people, Hollywood, just kind of sit back and, and soak up the overall feeling of this. That's going to be the key to this film, I feel. <laughs> Napoleon. There you go. Um, long live the Emperor. Uh, if you're going there wanting to shout Vive l'Empereur, I think you're going to enjoy it. You know, look, you're going to get a fairly big budget. It was like 200 million to produce this film. Um, so you're going to get a fairly big budget. Very kind of eye-popping depiction. Sure, there are going to be mistakes with the costumes. There are mistakes with all of the costumes. That's always the way. But... A lot of money has clearly gone into kind of taking the paintings that we have from this period. You know, your uh, David's, just Google David Napoleon, you'll come up with some stunning images from this period. Lots of those have been kind of taken and they're being turned into a screen depiction. So that's where the money has gone for a lot of this. I think there is going to be a huge amount for us to enjoy. That's going to wrap it up for today. Remember to drop a like and subscribe if you're new here so that you can find your way back. We'll be doing plenty more in terms of breakdowns and histories of the period. I've been Zach White, your host of the Napoleonic Wars TV channel. Take care of yourselves, my friends. Stay well, stay safe, and thank you for watching.